Hallelujah. Everybody, come on, stand on your feet, stand on your feet, stand on your feet. How many is glad to be in God's house? I'm pumped up. I'm telling you right now, I'm pumped up. I just flew back in from Texas uh, yesterday or last night. I preached in Mont Bellevue, Texas at an incredible church and uh, preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, gave an altar call, and almost 50 people came to the altar, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God broke out, and I got back to the room at about 12 p.m., and then got up this morning and flew back here so I could be with you all, which meant I just wanted to come home and see you, right? So I need you to do something. I need you to find three people around you and just look them dead in the eye and say, I must be so pretty. My pastor had to come all the way back home just to see me and give them a handshake tonight. Come on, go ahead and do it. The Lord will forgive you to, for lying to some of them. The Lord will forgive you for lying a little bit. Amen. Before you're seated, how about let's do this. Let's give Jesus the greatest praise we've given him all night long. Come on, somebody. Come on, give Jesus a praise. Give Jesus a praise. Give Jesus a praise. All right, you can be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. Thank you so much for being here and for all of you that are tuned in from around America. Thank you so much for also uh, joining us online. And I want to encourage you. So many people are watching every single week. If you're watching and you're consuming what God is giving us to pour into your life, please help partner with us to do ministry uh, because we got to have your help as well to do what God has called us to do. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving uh, to the Lord tonight. I want you to uh, do me a favor, take out your Bible, and, uh, and uh, I need my phone, Pastor Steve, if you could give me that. I, uh, I want you to take out your Bible, and I want you to go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Now, you're going to need your Bible tonight because we're going to be doing a lot of moving around in the Scripture, a lot of moving around in the Scripture tonight. Um, over the last several weeks, we've been talking about the signs of the times, uh, the signs in the, in the heavens. We've been talking about uh, the days that we're living in, the prophetic times that we, you and I have been graced by God to be a part of. And I do mean that, graced by God. You do realize every apostle dreamed of living in the day that you and I are living in, where the ends of the earth have come upon humanity. I believe that we're close to the coming of Jesus in the clouds of glory. I believe that more than I've ever believed that. And uh, I think that all of us need to be ready because at any moment, He could come. And uh, we need to be ready for His coming. Amen? And then in the meantime, if He hasn't come, we need to be ready for the spirit of the Antichrist that is arising in the earth to deceive, distract, and to destroy us. And so there is a warfare going on. Tonight, I'm going to share some stuff with you that I'll follow up on Sunday morning. Now, Sunday morning, I'm, or Sunday, 4 o'clock, I'm so sorry. I can't get my times right. A Sunday at 4 o'clock, I'm going to be uh, coming back to this message that I'm going to start tonight, and I'm actually going to give you a prophetic promise that is hidden in prophetic passages. On the face value, when you read it, it looks like that it is condemnation for the last days. But I've been doing something with the, uh, the Greek language of the New Testament, and I discovered something that I want to show you Sunday that's going to give you a lot of hope about the times in which we live, all right? But how many of you guys are ready to go deep in the things of God tonight, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the power or the, the privilege to study your Word and for the power of the Holy Spirit that comes upon us in these days in which we live to empower us to be holy, to be separate from this world that we're in, to be in the world but not of it, to have your glory on our life. Lord, you have ordained us for this moment, and so we want to live up to everything you've called and purposed us for in this hour. And uh, tonight we cry, as the early church used to cry, Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. We are looking for your appearance in the clouds so that we can be with you. And, uh, and so, Lord, tonight we worship you as we get into your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to talk to you uh, for the next uh, couple of services. And again, I've just kind of been following the Holy Spirit on strong delusion. 
strong delusion. Uh, it is obvious that we're living in a very evil age. It is also extremely obvious that this evil age is escalating right before our eyes. I don't know if you guys have paid attention to just how evil things have gotten in the last 10 to 15 years, two decades in particular. It has gotten so evil, I'll be honest with you, I never dreamed when I started preaching the gospel uh, full-time back in 1990, I never dreamed that I would ever see the days in which we're living right now, nor the abominations of our country uh, that, that we're in the midst of right now. It reminds me of a book uh, George Orwell wrote. It's entitled 1984. If you've never read, read uh, George Orwell's book, 1984, you need to download it, and you need to read it just for fun. In that book, you find an entire society that has been brainwashed into accepting uh, absurdities. Three specific absurdities. Number one, that war is actually peace. Number two, that freedom is actually slavery. And number three, that ignorance is actually strength. Now I want you to think about what he wrote there. He wrote there that society in 1984 was brainwashed into believing that war is peace, that freedom is slavery, and that ignorance is strength. Now I don't know about you, but that sounds eerily similar to the hour in which I live right now. We live in a time which is considered to be the most intellectual time in human history. Fulfilling Daniel that we talked about a few weeks ago, that in the last days, knowledge would increase. Knowledge is increasing right now, every couple of months. We're supposed to be the smartest, most intelligent society in the history of the world, and particularly Americans are supposed to be exceptional in their intelligence over most other societies. It reminds me of another time during history. During the French Revolution, they had something called so-called Enlightenment Movement that everybody thought that they had stepped into a season or a moment of enlightenment. And let me tell you what it produced. The Enlightenment movement produced bloodthirsty mobs with pitchforks and torches. It produced gallows of which tens of thousands of people uh, were hung on those gallows. Hundreds of them daily hung on those gallows, gallows while people in the society who were enlightened, who believed that war is peace, that freedom is slavery, that ignorance is strength, they celebrated innocent people dying at the gallows, and yet they were supposed to be the Enlightenment movement. And this movement was supposedly built on the worship of reason. And the French Revolution sure produced a lot of nutcases, if you go back and look at what came out of the French Revolution. Now, centuries before... The French Revolution, you have the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire also prided itself on its wisdom and its refinement and sophistication in the midst of civilization. Eventually, however, the wheels started coming off the chariot of the Roman cultural society. Sanity lost its way and it produced emperors who had all the reasoning power of Charles Manson most of them sexually immoral, debased human beings, many of them pedophiles. These were the leaders of a civilization that was supposed to be the most enlightened, or y'all see where I'm going with this, the most enlightened civil society on the planet. They became so immoral so debased in their thinking, even though they thought they were so intelligent, that masses of people would gather in the Colosseum to watch human beings, even children, be fed to lions. Men slaughter one another 
in gladiator games. And every time somebody died in torture and screamed in pain, the crowd would stand and cheer and then actually throw roses down to the person who just murdered one of his other comrades. This is supposed to be an enlightened civilization that says that war is peace and freedom is slavery and ignorance is strength. Isn't it amazing how as we think we're growing smarter, we actually grow stupid? The prophet Isaiah talked about this long before the Roman Empire. In Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet came along and he said, Hey, this is 700 years before Christ. He looked at his neighbors and he wrote this about his society in which he lived. And they thought they were very intelligent too. He said, Woe to those who call evil good. And good, evil. What I'm trying to do tonight before I get into the crux of what I want to teach you is I'm trying to tell you that gone are the good old days of common sense and character. Now every single abomination is held as moral and every single lunacy is declared as sanity. You and I are currently experiencing Guys, a full-scale, multi-pronged cultural offensive that is aimed at removing once and for all traditional faith and morality from every sector of our society, from our laws, from our courts, from our schools, from our marketplaces, and from our churches. And this current war of the world's is demanding no less than for you and I to sacrifice whatever is necessary to save a generation and to turn a nation back toward God. It's going to cost us something as a church if we want to see God visit America in revival once again. And I'm telling you right now, if we remain silent in the dangerous days in which we live, all the gains that we thought that we have made as a civilization are going to be wiped out in a sudden and ferocious counterattack by the forces of secular humanism and moral relativism that is plaguing the generation that we live in. In the process, the God-given disciplines of science and arts that made our nation what it is, is now being misused as weapons in a cultural conflict for the hearts and fellow citizens of our nation. Are you listening to me tonight? The church better wake up. I said the church better wake up. We're in the middle of a warfare, brother, and it's not time to go on a retreat. It's time to regroup, regather, pick up our weapons of warfare, and fight the devil in every sector of our society. As with the Jewish resistance in Israel under the Greeks, we are under intense pressure to surrender our distinctives and allow ourselves to be assimilated into an idolatrous, pagan, popular culture. The pressure is on right now for us just to be quiet, sit down, shut our mouth, and assimilate into the popular culture of our day. The culture is demanding not the sacrifice of a pig, on an altar. The culture demands something even more profane, that we sacrifice the truth of the gospel on the altar of political and cultural correctness. That's what the culture wants us to do. They want me to stop proclaiming that Jesus is the only way. But I'm telling you right now, I can't do it. And you and I can do it. And we need to realize that there is a price that we must pay to save a generation, to restore a nation, to revitalize a civilization. The question tonight is, are we willing to pay the price for the move of God to hit our nation? The commander 
of the host of heaven's army, God himself is standing by, I believe, to grace our efforts and assure our victory if we'll pick up our arms and fight this battle vigilantly and declare to the devil that you cannot have our children, you cannot have our home, you cannot have our churches, you cannot have our nation, you cannot have it. It belongs to the Lord. The problem is the church in our nation And here's where it's going to get nasty. The church in the nation, on the whole, is self-absorbed, pleasure-driven, comfort-seeking. The church in our nation is obsessed with entertainment. We want to be entertained, yet we find ourselves utterly bored. We're in the midst of what an author, a great author, Neil Postman, once described, and I, he described it this way. He described our culture as amusing ourselves to death. That's where we're at in the church world. I'm not talking about the secular world. I'm talking about the church world. Because God doesn't determine if he's going to pour out his spirit by what the secular world does. He determines that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, He says, I'll do it for my people. I've come to tell you tonight, I'm going to show you some shocking stuff. But the reason I'm going to show you this shocking stuff is to shock you out of this entertainment culture that's in the church. The culture where convenience, not commitment, has become paramount. Convenience, not commitment. That's what we're about in the modern church. But I believe that God is looking for a few good men and women who will stand in the gap to save many. Something that I like to call a saving remnant. Do I have anybody in Cookville, Tennessee that wants to be a part of the saving remnant? He's seeking for a people of God who is marked by the recognition of the existence of a demonical host in heavenly places. He's looking for a church who understands that in both the old and new dispensation, that at the highest point of spiritual power for that people of God was when they recognized, when the leaders recognized that the weapons of their warfare were not carnal, but they're mighty through God. They recognized that their battle was not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers in the heavenly places. In the Old and New Testament alike, whenever the people of God got out of the natural realm and got their eyes in the spirit realm and realized that the enemy they was facing wasn't necessarily an army on the earth, but it was an army in the realm of the spirit, it was at that point that God would dispatch angels to come and fight for them and give them the victory in the midst of their culture. And I'm convinced tonight that that same God who has a host of heaven under his command will send a mighty army of angels into America to turn the nation back around. I wish I had about 50 people who would believe that with me. Come on, this is our moment. Now, I don't know why the church in the 20th and the 21st century has refused to recognize the existence and the workings of evil supernatural forces. Nobody's talking about the mnemonic anymore. Nobody's talking about spiritual warfare anymore. We are so focused in the natural. We're fleshly driven. Hear me, child of God. We who have begun in the Spirit cannot finish in the flesh. We will die in that realm. But we who have begun in the Spirit, if we will get back and finish strong in the Spirit, no weapon that is formed against us will be able to prosper and God will come through and fight for us. Even at this present time, when the existence of evil spirits is recognized by heathens, heathens, newscasters who blaspheme God, 
music artists who have verbally acknowledged they have sold their soul to the devil to reach fame. Willingly acknowledge the existence of evil while the church buries its head in the proverbial sand of religion. And 62% of people who claim to be born again don't even believe in a real, literal devil or a literal place called hell for the departed damned. Something is wrong in the church. We have been duped into believing. That this devil thing and these demon things and this spiritual warfare thing is just all imaginary. We're more focused on self-help books. Self-help books fly off the, uh, off the shelves of bookstores. But find me a book that deals with your character. Challenge you challenges you to change the way you live. And those books sit there because nobody wants to buy those. And to make it worse, we brought that mindset into the church that doesn't acknowledge at all the existence of an evil spirit realm, an adversary called the devil who wants to destroy us. And we put a pulpiteer behind who's more interested in a paycheck than he is in deliverance. And he gets up there and he spouses or spews something that would be more akin to found on an Oprah Winfrey show or a Dr. Phil set. But you'll never find it in the annals of the early New Testament church. The kind of preaching that sets the captive free. The kind of preaching that opens blind eyes. The kind of preaching that will run the devil out of somebody's life. The kind of preaching that brings conviction on a soul. You never find that anymore. It's because we don't believe in a real devil. We don't believe in a real hell. We really don't. But tonight, I'm about to wake you up. We got to wake up. I said we got to wake up. And we need to take the words of the Apostle Paul very seriously found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But notice now, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places or in the spirit realm. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in this evil day and having done all to stand. Paul believed in a dynasty of evil that Satan had a kingdom a spiritual dynasty that was in the heavenly places that was made up of ranking spirits who had one goal in mind your destruction your destruction Paul believed in it he believed that the child of God needed to be dressed for battle all the time if they ever thought that they might be able to stand in the midst of an evil culture that calls evil good and good evil. You don't believe that our culture is fascinated with the demonic? Let me take you on a little journey. Guys, we have a video. I want you to turn your attention to the screen. Watch this video, and they're going to turn up the volume so you can hear it. Kim Petras and Sam Smith had an epic night at the 2023 Grammys. The duo hit the stage to deliver a majorly racy performance of their hit song, Unholy. Kim was seen on stage in a cage surrounded by dancers with whips. 
Sam rocked a bright red top hat with horns while belting out the song for the audience, and the crowd went wild for their performance. Sam, thank you. You're a true angel and hero in my life, and I love you. And everyone who made the song, too. I love you guys so much. Earlier in the night, the pair won Best Pop Duo Group Performance for their hit song, Unholy. And while accepting the award, Kim was so excited to make history as the first transgender woman to win in the category. Sam graciously wanted me to accept this award because I'm the first uh, transgender woman to win this award. <laughs> By the way, he is, considers himself non-binary and transgender as well. The entire performance was the glorification of Satan himself. And that gets the top award in our music industry. Many of the people that you just heard right there talking have admittedly said boldly, they sold their soul to the devil. They admit that all over Hollywood, your actors and your musicians all over Hollywood are going to different ceremonies where chickens and animals are being slain and blood spread on them as they sell their soul to the devil. But don't let it bother you. Don't let it bother you, church. Those of you watching online, don't let it bother you. Because I promise you, if I looked at a teenager's phone in this room, in his playlist, would be these people and many more like them. They don't, our children don't even understand what they're listening to. That it's not just words put to a beat, but it's a spirit that is attached to it, that is released over a generation to dupe them into believing that evil is good and good is evil. And then you have people like little Nas X that designs a shoe and makes sure that he brands it with a scripture on the toe. Luke 10. You've got authority to tread upon serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy. But on the back side of it, he makes sure that it's branded with 666. And in the advertisement, he looks like a devil. And this is commonplace. Commonplace. One of the young ladies here had a pair of shoes on one night, and I was bragging on the shoes. I thought they looked cool. I didn't know anything about the cool. She told me the brand name of them. I didn't know what the brand name was. And the next week, she come back, and I said, where's your shoes at? She said, oh, I got rid of those things. I said, what's wrong? What were they called? Balenciago. Why would you get rid of them? They're child sex trafficking shoes. But our kids think that's cool. That there's nothing wrong with that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to wake you up that it is time for the church to come out of this slumber that we're in and realize that we are in a warfare for the souls of humanity right now. And the only redeeming factor is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It is time to wake up. And I could spend hours with pictures. I just thought I'd grab a couple for you tonight. Not only that, I want to show you something else. How many of you in here have ever heard of CERN? CERN is a particle accelerator that's located in Switzerland, Geneva, Switzerland. This particle accelerator exists for the purpose of trying to discover something called the God gene. God gene. The one thing that could be the source of the entire universe 
even though science has been telling us for years that we all came from a bang. Now they're trying to discover what the source of the universe is. What is the God gene? And they're, they're, they're accelerating particles at almost the speed of light, crashing these particles into one another. And many of the scientists there say they're doing it for the purpose of opening portals to different dimensions of the universe. Some scientists have claimed, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but some scientists have claimed that they've actually gotten responses from other dimensions. There are people who actually believe that all of the UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena, what we used to call UFOs, that many of the UAP sightings and the, th the manifestations that we're seeing in the earth could be the result of what they're doing with this particle accelerator, opening dimensions that's allowing entities to come into this dimension from another dimension. But we don't believe in that, do we? We don't believe that there are entities in another dimension. Used to, when I would preach that stuff, they would call me crazy, and other preachers would say, I believe that, but I can't preach it, and I can't talk about it, because the people kicked me out of my church. People would ask me, do you believe in aliens? I said, absolutely. Aliens is life on another planet. I know there's another planet called heaven, and I know there's beings there. And I believe in angels. Yeah, there are beings outside of this dimension. But we don't really believe that stuff anymore because we just come to church and we live in the natural realm. But it's interesting that heathens will gather together and try with science to open a stargate to invite entities that we have no clue about, no understanding about, into our dimension. And then to beat it all, this multi-billion dollar international project that we are working on, building this tunnel, we got to have a dedication service for it. And you know, at a dedication service, hey, let's just break a bottle of wine and wish all the scientists well, right? Well, let's see. Play that, play that dedication service for me. Turn it up. Notice the seance in front of the goddess Shiva. Shiva is an Indian god of destruction, the destroyer. Does it look innocent to you? I'm going to let them continue to play it. What are they really doing? Is this really just about something scientific? Or is there something nefarious going on by the world's richest people? And why is it that they believe that they can do something to access the supernatural and they don't even believe in God? They mock the God that you and I claim that we believe in. They believe in a devil. They pray to him. They sacrifice to him. They talk to him. They build statues to him. They worship him. Yet we don't believe that. What's going on? It's demonic. Come on, somebody say, it's demonic. Let me tell you a little bit more about CERN. CERN is firing up the particle accelerator on April the 8th. And for the first time, they're putting it full power. You think that's an accident? Why would you choose April the 8th with all of these 
signs in the heavens. You're going to fire it up. You're going to do it at full power so that you can try to open a portal as if we need anything else to get freaky on the earth. You don't think CERN is up to something? Let me show you a picture of the statue. This statue, again, is Shiva. The destroyer. Over across is Newsweek magazine. And former President Obama is on the cover of Newsweek magazine in the exact same pose. You don't think that somebody somewhere understands at least a little bit of something that has to do with the spirit realm at all? Why would you pose a president in the same form as Shiva the destroyer? And then we wonder, we open by doing this, we open ourselves up to the spirit that is behind this idol. So I need to tell you a little bit about it in just a moment, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to just a little bit something else here. i got, I got I to show you this. Let me show you CERN's logo. Most people see circles in line. I'll tell you what I see. Six, six, six. Come on. Even lost people know that 666 is a little. And you choose that as your logo. So here we have a machine with 666 over it, with the goddess Shiva, who is known as the destroyer, standing out front of it, who have done demonic seances on a dedication, and we're going to fire it up on April the 8th. And the same time we're doing that, not NASA is launching three rockets into the shadow of the eclipse. They've named all three of these rockets Apep. Apep was known as Apophis in Greek. Apep was the Egyptian god of chaos. Oh, that sounds great, doesn't it? Why would you name it that? Can't you just give it a number like you did Apollo 11? Why do we got to name it after the Egyptian god of chaos? Apep was the polar opposite, watch now, of the godly personification order and the chief enemy of the kings of the gods, which was the sun god, Ra. So here, watch now, we have secular folks launching rockets in honor of a serpent deity out of Egypt into the shadow as if we're trying to say to the chief God of the heavens in your face. Now, I just want to tell you something. I'm a little freaked out by the eclipse. I'm a little freaked out by all the things around the eclipse, everything I've been preaching to you for the last three weeks. i got to tell you, it's got me a little bit on edge. But when I see governments intentionally provoking the realm of the demonic, they're not sending something up and calling it an angel. We're provoking the realm of the demonic. They don't know what they're doing. Let me go back to CERN. Because CERN happens to be located in a very specific location over the temple of Apollo. The ancient Greek temple of Apollo. Apollyon. Wow, where have I heard that at? Revelation chapter 9, verse number 1. Listen to this. Then the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them, 
was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle, and on their head were crowns of something like gold, and their faces was like the face of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like the lion's teeth. And they had a breastplate like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men for five months. Look now. And they had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek is the name Apollyon. So here... We build a particle accelerator over the former temple of Apollo, Apollyon. Apollo is known as the god of destruction. And we're going to poke the bear. We're going to provoke the demonic rim and try to open a dimension. For years, I wondered how could this happen? Could it be that we're living in an age where there's actually a demonic entity in the spirit realm that has come down to give some men the ability to open the dimension called the bottomless pit? Not knowing that when they open this dimension that coming out of that is a horde from a realm that they don't know anything about that is going to cause destruction and pain and death upon this planet. But we don't believe in that stuff. Because if we do, we'll be labeled conspiracy theorists. Ding, ding, ding. That's me, Johnny. Somebody the other night said, I can't believe that your videos haven't been taken down. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If they take them down, I'm still going to preach it anyway. I'm still going to preach it anyway. It is high time that we warn people, if you think the spiritual warfare has been bad over the course of the last five, six, seven years, I'm telling you, you have not seen anything like what is coming upon the earth. There is a demonic invasion that is heading into the earth realm like we have never experienced before. And we better get about doing what the Apostle Paul said. We better put on the whole armor of God. We better arm ourselves. We better protect ourselves. We better get full of the Holy Ghost. We better start memorizing the Word of God and put it deep in our heart we better know how to stand when everything goes wrong the days are coming my friend and God needs an army and I've just come to tell you I've got steel in my backbone and I'm mad about it and I'm going to stand in the midst of the adversary and let the devil know you're not going to take my house no 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 Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise in here right now. Come on. Come on, I got any warriors in Cookville, Tennessee? Do I got any warriors online right now? How does the Bible define and describe the days that we're living in? You can't buy this information in a Bible bookstore. And they won't teach you this in Bible college. Trust me. Paul described it this way, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Pay attention to his words. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled or either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now, stop right there. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about the day that you and I are looking forward to of the Lord's coming. But in the early church, there was no internet. They couldn't stream their messages. You actually had to get out of bed. 
and go to church. Many of them at the peril of their life. Y'all remember the fish symbol. That's how you found your place of worship. But somewhere in the early churches, somebody probably had an ecstatic prophecy. In other words, somebody probably stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord in the early church. And they gave a prophecy that the Lord had come. Then somebody put it in writing and it started circulating around the churches that the Lord had come. Well, everybody in the early church was looking for His coming. Which begs me to say right now, if everybody then was looking for His coming, how much more should we be looking for His coming now? So a panic hit the early church. That they had missed the return of the Lord Jesus. And they were here to live through what was prophesied. And Paul comes along and says, don't believe the letter. I haven't written a letter. I haven't told anybody anything. There's not been anything that the, the Lord has not come yet. And then he says, here's how you'll know he's getting ready to come. Now you better put your seatbelt on for this one. Notice how he starts it. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sets his God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. In other words, what's restraining is you. You're still here, so He can't show up. Look at the context of the passage. He starts out. Quit worrying about whether the Lord's come. He's not come yet. You're still here. So let me tell you how this has got to roll out. There's going to be a falling away, a mass deception. Listen now. He's writing to the church of Thessalonica. He's not writing to the world. There'll be a mass deception that'll hit the church and people will begin to throw violently away their faith. The Greek word apocalypso, the falling away. This will be the birth canal for the apocalypse. A strong delusion will come into the church. The church that is convenient-minded not commitment-minded. The church that wants entertainment, not anointing. The church that wants a homily and a hymn, but wants to, don't want to see anybody delivered. A church that wants to sit on a pew, but doesn't want you to give an altar call and challenge people to come out of their sin. This falling away will come first. The problem is, I don't think that he means that people will leave church. I have a feeling they'll sit right there in the building with the shadow of religion as their garment. Because he writes later, they'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof. That's the reason when Jesus talks about the last days, he talks about a separation of the wheat and the tares. He said, let them all grow up together. There are people sitting in churches all over the world right now that are as lost as anybody walking the streets on drugs tonight. They lift their hands, they sing songs, they might even do a little buck and huck in the church from time to time, but whenever Jesus comes, they'll not make heaven. They think they're right. They're under a delusion. They'll listen to preaching, but they won't live it. Everybody say, preach on, Pastor. I'm going to. I'm going to. I intend to offend everybody who ain't living right. I'm telling you right now, if you're not living right, you will get left. 
That's just how it's going to be. And we're living in the day when God is separating the wheat and the chaff. And I'm thankful for it. Because I don't want to be in a foxhole in the middle of a battle and have my armor on only to get shot in the back by somebody I thought who would stand and fight with me whenever the battle gets going. I want to know who's sitting beside me in church. I want to know those who labor among me. I want to know those who have an anointing to fight with me. I want to know. That's the reason small groups needs to be a serious thing. Because you can't get to know somebody by just coming to church. They can look good in their Sunday best. But they're a Monday mess. And they can't do nothing for God. I'm telling you right now. There's got to be a relational drive to the church. There's two things, in my opinion, the Lord's been dealing with me that's got to happen. This church needs to become extremely relationally driven. And number two, a prayer army has got to arise. A prayer culture has got to arise in this church. The days are coming that the only thing that's going to keep us in discernment is a spirit of prayerlessness, a prayerfulness, a spirit of prayerfulness. Somebody say amen. amen. He said that day can't come unless there's a falling away first. Then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposed exalted himself above all this God. Verse number five, do you not remember when I was with you? I told you this stuff. And now you know what's restraining. You are. The church is holding back the manifestation, the full manifestation of the Antichrist. He'll be revealed in his own time. For, watch now, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. I hope I'm there on a white horse beside Jesus to see that. When we come out of heaven and he sees Jesus and falls over, I'm going to say, nana, nana, boo, boo. Can I study this passage for a moment? The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. The Greek word there is, an inner, inner, is the word we get energy from. Paul's using a word play here because what built the early church was the energa energy of the Holy Ghost. So what he's saying is there's a different energy that will come into the church. Y'all ain't ready for this. It'll be Satan and here's the deal. He's going to do it with power, signs, and lying wonders. He's going to look Pentecostal. Because I don't know many Baptist folks looking for signs and wonders. I can't find a church of Christ in Cookville who believes in signs and wonders and miracles. This sounds like charismatic folk. When I say charismatic, I'm not talking about the weird kind. I'm talking about the people who believe in the moving of the Holy Ghost. They're not cessationists. They're continuationists. They believe that God still does it. And what's scary to me is that we could be having a church gathering and somebody over here give a message in tongue and interpretation and be all together the energy of the Holy Ghost. And yet another person right over here on the other side of the church might give a tongue and interpretation and be all together the energy of Satan. You say, well, why is that important? Because if you can't discern the difference between the two, delusion comes on the heels of it. And if you open your spirit to that, hmm. can I keep going? He'll do it with all power, signs, lying, wonders. And watch this. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. This deception is not going to fool everybody in the house. It'll only get to the ones who really don't know Jesus. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Say that phrase out loud with me, please. God will send them strong delusion. Come on, one more time. God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Look at me tonight. If you take pleasure in living contrary to the commands of God's Word in any area of your life, you are a target for this end time delusion to set in on you. You better put the whole armor of God on. You better totally surrender to Jesus every area of your life. Now, i got a problem here. The Bible says God will send them strong delusion and they will believe a lie. How does this work? How does this work? God doesn't deceive. How can God send them a strong delusion? What if I could show you how God does it? Because we actually have an example of it. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 18. I'm almost done. Can you all handle another five minutes or so? St. Chronicles 18. Then Micah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, all the host of heaven standing on His right hand and His left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward. And he stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So he said to the Lord, I'll go out and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do it. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, the Lord declared disaster against you. Now in this passage, the context is Ahab had given the nation over to idols. You know the story. God tried many ways to get his attention. Ahab refused to repent. God sends Micah, the prophet, to him. And when Micah prophesied to him, judgment was coming if he didn't repent. Ahab says to Micah, every time you show up, all you do is give me a bad sermon. All you do is preach holiness. Every time you show up. And I want you to know, I don't go to that kind of church. And if you don't change your message, I'll either leave or better yet, I'll stop paying my tithe. And we'll starve you out and we'll get another preacher. But you got to quit prophesying bad stuff to me. Because I go to the first church of the convenient. I want my Dr. Phil message. I need Oprah to talk to me from time to time. Get me off the ledge of life. I don't need you mingling or meddling in my personal affairs. Whether I drink or not, not up to you. Whether I cuss or not, not up to you. Whether I live with my girlfriend or not, not up to you. Whether I have sex outside of marriage, not up to you. Adultery, that's not your business. What I do outside of church is my business. So at church, just give me a placebo. Don't give me any real medicine that has power to change the disease in my body. Just give me a placebo of religion. Make me feel good about my flesh. Stroke my flesh. 
Can y'all tell I'm aggravated about it? I hope you're aggravated about it too. So Micah goes back to the Lord and says, Lord, he ain't listening to me. And the Lord said, let me tell you what's going to happen. And all of a sudden he gets a vision and he's taken into the heavenly realms where the throne room of God is. And standing to God's left and to God's right are all of these angelic, high-ranking spirit beings, principality, that have been given rule and territory. To implement good and evil. These are not all good spirits up here. How do I know? Because one of them says he's a lion spirit. And in God there's no lie. There's neither variableness nor shadow of turn. God's not a man that he can lie. So this is a wicked spirit up there. Well, the Bible obviously tells us in Job chapter 1, from time to time, God calls all the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, the high-ranking Elohim, the high-ranking Elohim. These are, these are God's little g. In the... To come give their an account of themselves. Revelation chapter 12 says that when Satan comes to give an account, he accuses the brethren before God day and night. So Satan's among them. He was among them in Job chapter 1. He's among them in Revelation chapter 12. A lying spirit right now is among them in 2 Chronicles chapter 18. So in this divine council meeting, God's talking about Ahab and said, I'm going to bring judgment on Ahab. He hasn't listened to me and I'm cutting him off. Now, it wasn't that God did it. Ahab did it to himself. Like Pharaoh hardened his heart, God hardened his hand. Pharaoh hardened his heart, God hardened his hand. And finally, once you bow your neck enough against God and His principles, there is a place, I don't care how, much you think he is loving and graceful and merciful, there is a place where you can frustrate the grace of God to the point that God will turn you over. That ain't preached in church anymore. The early church believed in it so much that they had a man that wouldn't repent for adultery. And they gave him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that somehow in the middle of the pain he might repent of his sin so that his soul would be saved. Imagine if we started apostolically dealing with immoral behavior like that in the local church. I have a feeling our churches would be much smaller. But they also might have much more power. So this angel, this Elohim, this high-ranking spiritual being comes to the, I'll be the lying spirit. And I'll go down to his prophets. Because he had other prophets. He had itching ears. He just needed the right message. What he thought was right. So this lying spirit found a prophet with a little p that was really more controlled by paycheck and likes on Facebook than he was by the real word of the Lord. And that lying spirit got in his ear and said, say this to him. And that prophet prophesied in the, New, in, the King ja in, in, in the New Testament, the Bible calls them a false prophet. In the Greek, it's called pseudo-propheta. A pseudo-prophet. I might preach that come Sunday. A pseudo-prophet. He told him what he wanted to hear. He said, hey, you're going to have victory. If God be for you, can't nobody be against you. You're going to go out and you're going to win because the Lord's on your side. 
The problem is, he did not know that this false spirit was giving strong delusion that he might believe a lie for his own destruction. And Paul said, that's the way it's going to be in the last days. Look at me. That there's going to be an invasion from the realm of the Spirit that will come into this realm and whisper strong delusion to where people in the church a start calling evil good and good evil. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Everybody breathe. You look like you're about to pass out. I want to, I want to give you one more scripture. Then we'll come back to this one. Hmm. Paul said it like this in 1 Timothy 4. We read this all the time, but I want to bring it to you one last time tonight as we wrap this up. Now, the Spirit expressly says, in the Greek, it literally means shouting, yelling. Imagine the Holy Ghost tonight standing in this pulpit with this microphone at the top of His lungs yelling at you. And here's what he's yelling. In latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed not to bad preachers, but deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. There's that word pseudo again. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Pseudo Hippocrates lies in hypocrisy. And the people in church, because they have their conscience seared with a hot iron, in other words, because they heard the word of God but they didn't obey it. And they kept ignoring, kept ignoring, kept ignoring, kept ignoring, kept ignoring, kept ignoring the warnings, kept ignoring the voice of the Holy Spirit. Finally, their conscience got seared that they couldn't really hear the voice of God. And conviction would no longer set on their soul. And they became the perfect target for the lying spirit to draw them away from God. Are you guys here? Media team, i got to go back to a verse now. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let me show you a verse that should shock you tonight. And I'm closing with this verse. And then Sunday, we're going to come back to this. So what that means is I need your help tonight. I need you to walk out of here, get on Facebook and say, Oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. Everybody in the entire Upper Cumberland needs to come at 4 o'clock. You're never going to hear anything like it. I'm going to get one shot to tell them the truth. Let me show you something shocking. Most Christians don't know this. Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9 says, When the Most High appointed the nations, when He divided humankind, He fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the gods. Now this is the new Revised Standing Ver Revised Standard Version. This is actually the correct translation. When it says the number of the gods, in Hebrew it actually is the number of the Elohim. When God divided people groups, put boundaries of nations and towns and civilizations, there were Elohim, high-ranking spiritual beings, that were assigned to every single one of those territories. Now, if God did this, and let's say God dispatched angels, and he wants, a, he wants an Elohim over the Cookville or the Upper Cumberland area. He wants an Elohim over Nashville. He has an Elo, a higher-ranking Elohim over all of Tennessee. Other ones rank under him over different cities and territories. Are y'all listening to me? 
Where have, I, where, where have I heard that language for? Just keep that scripture on the screen. Where have I heard this language before? Here's where I've heard the language. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. In other words, there are these entities that these nutcases are praying to and trying to use science to open portals to get them to come into our dimension. And they have no idea what they're inviting into a civilization. And my question is, what if we're living in the day where it's actually working? And the reason it's becoming more and more demonic is because just as God has spirits, high-ranking spirits over territories and regions and over towns and over states and over specific nations. And there is a tiered system of a kingdom, a hierarchy of kingdom. If God has that, Satan we know is a counterfeit. He will do the same thing. And that's the reason Paul said, in this wicked day in which we live, when people call evil good and good evil, when people have their head buried in the sand and they're denying the existence of something called a real Satan or a real place called hell, it's important that the Christian understand that there is a war going on. And it's not a fleshly carnal war. But it is a war of spirits invading our dimension. And we need the armor of God to be able to stand against everything that the devil wants to bring against us. So the spirit shall. In the last. I'm convinced if the Holy Ghost was here in the pulpit tonight shouting in person, preaching this message, he would shout to you, you are living in perilous times. It's not coming, it's here. I said it's not coming, it's here. It is not coming, it is here. You are living in perilous times where deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons are invading not only the world, but the church. So therefore, church stand against the principalities and the powers and the spiritual forces that are trying to take your civilization. Stand against them. Stand. For Ephesians chapter 3 says, For this purpose was the church born, to make known to the principalities and the powers the glory of God. The reason the church is here is to push that devil back until we're taken out of the way. That means if we're still here, God's still waiting on us with power. God has still given us power to tread upon. If I'm still here, I can still tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. If I'm still here, I still have authority in the name of Jesus. So I want us to stand all over this room. So let's. it's time for us. to take our rightful place and fight the good fight of faith. Now, the only bad fight I ever known of was the fight I didn't win. When Paul says, fight the good fight of faith, he's telling you, you can win it. Folks, we can win this fight. Now, that doesn't mean that all of civilization is just going to turn around and we're going to usher in some golden age like Kingdom Now theology says. Evil men will wax worse and worse. This thing will devolve into absolute, utter, total chaos. This will get immoral. But God forbid that it be in His house. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord of hosts. I'm going to tell you right now, people ask all the time, where has the anointing gone? The anointing is attached to
to holiness. The anointing is attached to holiness. So, Lord, if there is anything in my life that is not pleasing to you, I humble myself under your mighty hand tonight. And I truly, in, in the only way I know how, the best way I know how, I repent of any sin in my heart or my life any thought, any action that is contrary to your word, contrary to your best for me, I repent of it, Lord. I want to be your man. I want to be used by you. I want you to be able to trust me in the day in which I live, to lift up the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ in midst of this terrible, gross darkness that is upon the people. Lord, I humble myself before you. And I pray, Father, for the anointing of the Spirit of God. Everybody in this room, I pray that the power of the Holy Ghost would refill us to overflowing. That we would not be drawing from the bottle of the barrel of our relationship, but we would be drawing from the overflow of the Holy Ghost in our life. Lord, fill us up to the full tonight. Give us the gift of the discerning of spirits in the day in which we live so that when we walk into an environment, we know exactly what spirit is operating there and help us to be able to di differentiate between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Holy Ghost, we lean into you tonight. You made us a promise that you would lead us and guide us into all truth and deliver us from the evil one. I pray that over myself tonight, and I pray that over all of my friends tonight who are here and who are watching in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise for His Word. God bless you guys. Get out of here. I will see you Sunday at 4 p.m.